Hello and welcome back. Today we're looking at unit 4.1, which is on genetic engineering. Now this is actually a pretty short chapter in terms of what we cover because we're just trying to introduce the basics of these different techniques and what they're used for, how they're done, etc. So we're going to keep it very, very basic. And as such, this is actually going to be all the notes for the entire unit. Notice how it doesn't say part one or anything. These are all the notes for this entire unit. So we're just going to kind of go through it, do our brief explanation on the different things and all that fun stuff. All right. So you guys ready? Let's go. So first, let's introduce what um, biotech is. So biotechnology, very simply put, is techno technology that has uses in regards to biology. And we know biology is a science of life. So what it does is it looks at cellular processes and biomolecular processes in order to help develop new technologies and new products to improve the lives and health of people. So a lot of how we get new medicines or new medical devices, they are all because of biotech. And a lot of them are actually considered biotechnology because they are technology and advances for the purpose of helping us live better, healthier, longer lives. There are some controversies with different types of um, biotech. So there are many different kinds of, uh, sorry, biotechnologies, many, many different kinds, and there's many results. And some of these have become pretty well accepted. For instance, Prosthetic legs. It's a type of technology that helps someone live a, what we consider more normal life. So if they lost their leg in an accident, this way they have a technological replacement for it to help them be able to walk, run, anything like that. So it helps them live a better life. Um, it is a matter of convenience, but a lot of times we take walking for granted. So. And that's an example of a type of biotechnology that is accepted. However, there are also ones that are a bit more controversial. So for instance, there's been a lot of debate on vaccines and different kinds of medicines, when to use them, how much to use them, GMOs, which stand for genetically modified organisms. Now, a lot of these Science, um, scientists, doctors go through, they test them. And honestly, at least when it comes to the vaccines and medicine ones, most of the time, in my humble scientific opinion, it's because when people are against those, it's because they don't necessarily know that much about them. I can have a whole discussion on the anti vax movements and how that is detrimental to us as a society. But even today, like with Corona going around right now, there's a lot more anti-vaxxers changing their position and becoming pro-vaccines because with all this talk of coming up with a Corona vaccine, a lot of them are doing additional digging and research and they're finding out more about how vaccines are made and what they're made out of. And they're saying that it may not be too bad. So, you know, we keep changing our minds as a, a society, but overall, these things are considered safe for use by doctors, scientists, etc. So the first one we're going to talk about is some, a process called gel electrophoresis. Now, what this is, it's a procedure where we separate the DNA into chunks and we analyze these fragments um, by putting it into a gel, which is why we call it gel electrophoresis. Now, if you look at the picture at the bottom, this is a gel plate. You notice it has these little wells, these little holes up there. So what we do is we take the DNA and we add these things called restrictive enzymes or restriction enzymes to it. By adding these restriction enzymes, it cuts the DNA at particular locations and results in the DNA being in fragments. We then take that and put one sample in each of the wells. So there are three different samples here. So DNA from three different sources. 
And what we do is we put in one, two, three wells. Then we hook it up to an electric power source and we let the voltage go through the gel. Now DNA has a slightly negative charge, so it's gonna try and move away from the negative electrode and move towards the positive electrode. And depending on the size of the fragments, that's going to determine, if you look here, how far the fragments move. The smaller the fragments, the farther they move. The bigger the fragment, then they won't move as far away from the gel, or sorry, from the well. So we can use this to compare DNA samples and genomes of different individuals. Um, we can use it to tell if two people have the same DNA or what relationship they have to each other, which I'm at, is actually gonna bring us to the next part, which is DNA fingerprinting. That's a specific use for gel electrophoresis. So again, it's exactly what we talked about. It's using gel electrophoresis, but this time for a particular purpose. It's used to identify individuals. The most common, probably, yeah, the most common use for it is to identify, or is in forensics, to identify criminals. So if they find, you know, a blood donation or a blood sample at a crime scene, you're like, hmm, this could have come from the murderer. Let's take it and we'll analyze it and see if they're in the system. Or it gives them something to compare once they have a sub suspect. If someone was killed and they don't have any ID, but their DNA is in the system for whatever reason, or if, let's say, someone's missing and they need to identify the or identify them, they found a potential or they found the body, it might be this missing person, we don't know. Let's take a sample from the body, take a sample from maybe their hairbrush, something that a family member would bring in, and they can compare the DNAs to see, are the samples the same? As we said, it uses these things called restriction enzymes, and it cuts the DNA into segments or fragments at specific base sequences. Um, another use for this, which may not be the most common, but probably the most entertaining would be paternity tests. So, you know, you see like on those shows, you are the father, you are not the father. That's what we mean. I see, so paternity tests. So for instance, here we go. This is the child's gel electrophoresis. So these are where the fragments look, were in the gel. Um, from the baby's DNA. Here's mom's. We can see that baby has a lot in common with mom, which we would expect because baby is related to mom. And there are two possible fathers. Now, if we look, doesn't really seem like father two has a whole lot in common with the baby. But alleged father one, we got that one in common, that one, that one, that one. So we have more in common. That means that this guy is very likely to be the father of baby. And these things are like 99% accurate, I think, give or take. All right, let's keep on going. We also have something called genetic engineering. And this is a process of making changes in the actual DNA of a living organism. So when you talk, so when we talk about the word engineering, it means to make something, to design it. And genetic engineering is essentially changing the genes so that we are adding specific traits to an organism's DNA. I'm gonna move this. There's actually different kinds of genetic engineering. There is some that can be done in a lab, which there is a lot of um, questionality in terms of should that be done, but there's also kinds or certain types of genetic engineering that are not done in a lab. For instance, we can do it just by selective breeding. Now what selective breeding means is we can take an organism, so for instance, these were the wild cows up here in the picture. But what happened is over generations, we 
the cows that were born that had larger structure, um, more muscular structure, we only bred those. And the ones that looked more like this, we didn't breed them. So over time and over generations, we ended up with beef cows. They were specifically bred to have larger bone and muscular structure so that they can support having more meat so that, you know, we can eat beef. Um, it's exactly what we've done with dogs also. We've specifically bred different dogs to get certain breeds with certain traits. Um, Labradoodles were bred by crossing Labrador retrievers and poodles to get that uh, the playfulness and the traits of a retriever, generally with slightly curly hair and oftentimes they're pretty hypoallergenic like labs or not labs, like poodles are, so Labradors and poodles to get the Labradoodle. Um, dachshunds were specifically bred to have small legs so they can go into badger holes. Um, Shelties were bred to have a very, very loud bark and to be very agile as they herd the sheep around. So selective breeding is something that we can do. Another thing that we can do, which is a non-lab, also a non-lab version of genetic engineering, is something called hybridization. Now this is more often possible with plants than it is with animals. And what happens is you take two different plant or two different species of plant and we can actually cross them to create offspring that are more durable, maybe larger, et cetera, than the original, either of the original parent plants. So if you look over here, what they've done is they've crossed these two plants. So this one doesn't have any protection. Notice this one's like super thorny. This one doesn't have any. What they've done is they've crossed them and you have a plant that has some thorns for protection, but not so much that it's super thorny and we can't get to the plant full to harvest it. So it's not as, this one is more likely to be eaten by predators. This one is not, but it's so thorny, you can't harvest it. You cross them, you have an intermediate. You have this new version of the plants where it has some thorns to, you know, prevent predation by pests or whatever, but not so thorny that we can't go and harvest it for our own use. So those are examples of genetic engineering that actually don't involve a lab. A lot of times when people hear about GMOs, which are genetically modified organisms, they always assume that it's done in a lab, but a lot of it actually isn't. It's just done with selective breeding and hybridization. Put my camera back. All right, let's move on. Cloning. So this is a process of taking DNA from one organism and using it to create an offspring that is genetically identical to the parents. We've seen cloning in movies and TV shows. Um, you take the genetic information from a cell of one person and you use it to create a genetically identical version of them. Now notice how we keep saying that it's genetically identical because there's that whole nature versus nurture argument. And oftentimes that doesn't mean that when you clone someone or something that they will act completely the same as that original person or thing. Um, people have been talking about, you know, cloning pets when their pets die. But let's say some rich guy had a fancy schmancy poodle and he it poor thing got sick died and he wanted to clone it to get his poodle back however once you do that it's genetically identical but it doesn't mean it's going to be the same personality because it's not just our dna that determines who we are and how we act but nurture our experiences our memories things like that that plays a big role in it as well so how do we clone? Well, first we take the nucleus from a parent cell. So if, God forbid, someone wanted more Comars running around, they can take a skin cell and take the nucleus out of that skin cell. They can then place it in a healthy ovum. An ovum is just an egg cell. 
So they'll take an egg cell from a donor, they will remove the nucleus from the egg cell, and they will put the nucleus from my skin cell into that egg. Then they'll shock it and they'll cause it to go through mitosis. It is then placed inside of a surrogate womb and is allowed to grow and develop. And that's exactly what they did with Dolly the sheep. So here is the original sheep, the donor sheep right up here. They took a cell from her udder and they took the nucleus out of it. This was simply a surrogate sheep. So they took an egg from the surrogate sheep, removed the nucleus, put the nucleus from the donor into there. You see that going on right here. They fuse it, they shack it, and then it starts going through mitosis to develop into an embryo. Once they know that it's, the embryo is going to continue developing, they implant it back into the um, surrogate's womb, her uterus, and allow it to grow and develop. And then we have a lamb that's born that is genetically the same as this sheep right here. And I'm going to a little more detail on that in one of the videos in the additional resources. So it might be something to check out. Gene splicing. A lot of times this is what we what people think about when they hear the term genetic engineering. Now this is kind of a subset of genetic engineering. This is more the lab side of it as opposed to the selective breeding side. So the DNA of an organism is cut and a segment from another organism is put into the original DNA. So what that means is we are taking the, a segment of DNA, a specific gene maybe, from one organism and putting it into the DNA of another organism. Oftentimes we'll use these things called bacterial plasmids. Now the reason why we did is because it's circular DNA, it's easy for us to work with. And we use that to incorporate the DNA segment into the full DNA that we want. I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. We do also call this cell transformation because since we're adding new information, it could transform the organism to the point where it now has new traits. Let's talk about what that is. So, or, well, we have the picture up here, but first let's talk a little bit more about the actual what is going on. So there's a gene sequence that we wanna cut out of this organism's DNA because we're like, hey, that could be a pretty cool trait, a very useful trait. So we're gonna cut that out and we're gonna add it to the bacterial plasm plasmid, so that circular DNA. And then we're gonna make sure that it's all fused and closed up. We call that DNA recombination because we have to open up the DNA plasmid, insert the new gene, and then allow it to close back up. So recombining with itself to make that circular DNA once more. The bacteria will replicate the recombinant DNA over and over. So it's just making more and more and more and more and more copies of this new DNA, which is its DNA with this new gene added to it. And then we're gonna have lots and lots of copies from this. These copies can then be used for research so we can look to see how well they function in the bacteria. We can incorporate them into clones. We can use them for gene therapy. There's any number of things we can do with these copies once they're done. Ah, little nap. All right, so here is an animal cell. Here's the DNA. Here's the bacteria cell with its circular DNA. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the, genet the DNA from the animal cell, we're going to cut a piece of it out, a particular gene. We're also gonna take the bacteria DNA, notice it's circular. We're going to use a particular enzyme to cut it open. So we're not cutting anything out of the bacterial plasmid, of the circular DNA. We're just simply opening it up so that we can add the section from the animal cell DNA into it, and then we close it up. Since it's now off used, that's the DNA recombination. We can also call this itself recombinant DNA because it's DNA that's been recombined together. 
and now it is placed in the bacterial cell, again, to make more copies of it. Again, why can this be important? Well, there's any number of things. If you have time, go Google glow-in-the-dark trees, glow-in-the-dark fish. They've actually taken genes from um, bioluminescent bacteria and algae and put it into the genome of other organisms like trees, well, plants. The thought pattern behind that kind of research is if they can create trees that glow in the dark, maybe we won't need to have electric powered street lights so it's more sustainable. We have these glow in the dark trees lining the road instead of these lights, these man made lights that need energy and power plants to run them. So, again, it's just an idea that we, maybe we can use this technology to make this sustainable source. Um, they've also, like I said, they just to kind of test it out, they have tried it with goldfish, and there are glow in the dark goldfish. I think there's also glow in the dark cats that they've tried it with. So, they're kind of experimenting to see okay, will it work? Will it have any negative effects? And is this a series of inventions? I hesitate to say it, but is it a function? Is there a functional use for it? Similar to that is something called PCR directing DNA replication. So PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. And what it does is it amplifies a portion of DNA replication. So we have a selected part of the DNA, maybe it's one or two genes, but we have this one part, this one gene or something, and we just wanna make a whole bunch of copies of it. So what happens is, it's gonna be very, very similar to DNA replication. So you're going to have to unwind the DNA, um, polymerase, DNA polymerase is gonna go in there and copy, but it's only gonna copy this one part and it's gonna do it multiple, 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 multiple times. I mean, you can get multiple millions, even billions of copies of this one gene in, by going through this process. So it involves repeated cycles of denaturation of the double-stranded DNA. So you use heat to break the DNA apart so that it's no longer the wound up tight as a double helix. It kind of loosens up, it's no longer twisted, and the strands start to separate. Annealing of primers, so there are these specific primers that we put where the, or that will actually attach on the DNA to where the specific gene that we want to copy is located. And then we also have heat stable DNA polymerases. So DNA polymerase is the enzyme that reads the template strand and makes the, um, the replicated strand. Now it has to be heat stable because remember we used heat to separate the double strand. So we need these special DNA polymerases that can still function at these higher temperatures. So this is kind of what it looks like. We have the original DNA. We separate the strands by increasing the temperature. We add these special primers to where the particular gene is located. And then the polymerase comes in and will replicate just that portion. And it'll go through this again and again and again and again and again and again and again. So like I said, you can end up with billions of copies of this gene. You might be asking, well, why do we want that? Could be for research to find out what the actual function of these genes are. Could be if we want to splice them into organisms like the bioluminescent gene. They have also done where they've taken the gene for human insulin, made lots of copies of it, incorporated it into bacterial DNA, and used the bacteria to secrete human insulin. This way they can use a human insulin product to help treat diabetes as opposed to bovine insulin, which is cow insulin. And gene therapy. So we can use genetic engineering to help us treat or even prevent 
the genetic causes of diseases. Once again, we're going to need some kind of vector, whether this time it's again a bacteria or maybe even a virus. The point of this is to deliver a new gene to a target cell. So, for instance, in certain cases of hemophilia, it's be the reason why the so hemophilia, the blood doesn't clot properly, which leads to po the possibility of bleeding to death due to even small cuts. And the reason why that occurs is because of the um, a particular enzyme that helps with the coagulation of the blood isn't being produced by the cells. So what gene therapy is trying to do is, can we take the gene to make that enzyme and can we incorporate it into the cells of someone with hemophilia in order to help them produce that enzyme so that they will be able to clot their own blood and they won't have to worry about, oh no, I fell and scraped my knee. I need to go to the ER, otherwise I'm gonna bleed to death. So that's what gene therapy is kind of looking to do. And it's not just looking at this in terms of hemophilia, but any, they're trying to use this process in order to, um, like they're trying to use it for certain cancers or disorders like Huntington's and Parkinson's, maybe even Alzheimer's. So what they're trying to do is see if they can incorporate functioning genes into cells with a non-functional version of that gene in order to help the cell work normally. So once the gene enters the cell, the new DNA is transcribed and the new protein can now be expressed. Ah, wrong button. Sorry. Now there's a downside. Not all genes can be used for gene therapy. There are certain traits and disorders and all that that are caused by multiple genes that interact. And so the different combinations of alleles and how they interact can lead to different effects and different versions of disorders. Now, gene therapy is great if we just need to fix this one cell or this one type of cell with this one type of gene. But there are multiple genes involved and any number of combinations can affect how that gene gets expressed. It's gonna be very complex and actually too complex for us to modify at this point in time in our technology and our understanding. If we don't fully know the genetic basis of a particular trait, so if there's a, a disorder where we know it has this effect, but we don't know how it works on a cellular, on a molecular level, we can't use gene therapy. We can only use it if it's a one gene and we know how that gene works. Uh, there's no way to get new info to the affected cells. So yeah, the, this idea is great if we can take that vector, maybe the virus, and put it so that it's exposed to the one cell that, that we want it to be taken into, and then the virus can now deposit the gene there. But what if we can't access that cell? So if there's no way to get the information to the affected cell, then we can't use gene therapy. Ah, let's see now just the additional resources. So we do have some science in pajamas. I do have one on PCR directing DNA replication. So definitely maybe check that out a little more. I also have one on gel electrophoresis, how it's used, how we use it to compare different DNA samples. And then we also have one on cloning, where we talk about what it is and how it works, as well as the upsides and downsides of it. And then here are some other videos. Um, we have Crash Course Biology, or sorry, Biotechnology, which is underneath where my camera is. Amoeba Sisters Gel Electrophoresis, um, Fuse School Modern Cloning Techniques, Khan Academy Introduction to Genetic Engineering, and uh, animation by McGraw-Hill, which covers PCR again. 
So I'm not going to go and like show all of these things, but as part of this lesson, I would definitely recommend that you do take a look at them and use them to help enhance your own understanding. Now, if you have any other questions or concerns or just not quite sure what's going on, definitely hit me up in our Google Classroom or via email. Um, but in the meantime, you guys take care, stay well, and just stay healthy. Take care of yourselves. Hi, you guys. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.